My name's Rebecca and in this video I am going to be discussing the topic of multiple sclerosis and the carnivore diet. So in this video I just want to go a little bit deeper into the potential relationship between multiple sclerosis and the carnivore diet. So the reason I'm interested in, in these two topics is that I uh, have recently become a carnivore three months ago and I've had multiple sclerosis since 2016, seven years. And when I started the carnivore diet, I experienced a radical improvement in my health, um, which made me want to investigate more as to why that might be, and if it might be good for everybody with multiple sclerosis to switch to the carnivore diet. So first of all, what exactly is multiple sclerosis? Um, well, it's an autoimmune condition, and what's actually happening with it is the immune system is attacking uh, the nerve fibres in the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. At what it's attacking is, is the myelin sheathing around those nerve fibres, which is a bit like the casing around electrical wires. Um, so nobody knows why, but the immune system is triggered to attack that, and that is called demyelination, and that's a hallmark of MS. MS isn't the only condition which has demyelination, but it is, um, it's what they look for when you present with um, random nerve failure. So I, in my case, the nerve in my eye failed, and um, they did a series of scans, including an MRI scan, which is able to see the demyelination because it's looking into the soft tissue in the brain. So that, that's what's happening with MS, but the fact is, nobody knows why it happens, and nobody knows what to do about it, there's no, there's no cure. So it's progressive um, and incurable. <laughs> so, so that's good. There's various different types of MS. You've got um, the four main types. You've got primary progressive, secondary progressive, relapsing, remitting and benign MS. The differences between the four of those are about uh, the rate of disability. So um, I have relapsing, remitting MS, which is very common among um, my demographic, so so women between the ages of 25 and, and 40, I think it is, tend to go down with relapsing, remitting MS. Um, and that's when you have the attack on the myelin sheathing, but it then regenerates a bit. So, so you may be temporarily disabled, but it will piece itself back together. But you may be left with residual disability if it doesn't do a thorough job of it. Um, and um, that may continue for 15, 20 years. And usually it reaches the point where the remyelination doesn't happen anymore. And so you just progressively get more disabled. And that's called secondary progressive. Primary progressive is when you go down with that type of MS straight from the outset. So no remyelination, just attacks on the nerves and disability, progressive disability. And I believe it's men in their 60s that tend to go down with primary progressive from the outset. And then there's a small group of very lucky people who have benign MS um, and you don't know that you have benign MS until you've basically lived out the course of your disease and you can see after 15-20 years uh, you look back and you don't have a large amount of disability. You, you, with benign MS you do still have the symptoms, the everyday symptoms of MS, which I will describe in a minute. So, so that's the main types. Um, it's hard to say what the risk factors are. Um, a lack of vitamin D seems to be a common trend. I certainly had low vitamin D before I before the onset of, of, of MS for me. Um, it's hard to say otherwise what might cause it. It's actually geographically distributed. There's there's more MS in the northern hemisphere. So, which leads me to think there's an element of it's it's environmental, but it's it's to this day nobody can come up with a, a, a theory that, that, that explains it completely. Um, so the daily symptoms of MS, apart from temporary or permanent disability, um, you, m most people with MS experience extreme fatigue, neurological fatigue, um, balance issues, bladder issues, uh, random aches and pains, um, uh, muscle spasms, um, vision problems, um, speech swallowing problems um there's, there's 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 a whole range of symptoms actually and not everybody has all of them 
Um, so again, it's, it's just quite a nebulous condition. The fatigue was bad enough in my case that I, and I think for many people, that I couldn't have a shower without going on my hands and knees. And when I came out of the shower, I'd have to like rest for an hour because it was so exhausting. Um, and I was sofa bound most of the day and I was using a wheelchair. The brain fog, that, that's also a huge symptom, which I found very distressing because I became ill with MS while I was finishing my PhD. So I went from like a really high level of, of critical analysis and thought to not being able to follow basic instructions. So I basically became a different person. I didn't recognize myself. Anyway, um, so the usual MS treatment, and the, the, the current thinking is the sooner you get on these medications, the better for you. These treatments don't actually address your daily symptoms. They don't help them at all. And they always come with side effects. So it's a double whammy. What they're claiming may happen is you may get um, a, a slowing in the progression of the disease, basically. But you will never know if it actually did help in your case, because each case is individual and, and you can't compare your case to someone else's and draw a meaningful conclusion. And at the lower level, the entry level, medication you're only looking at a 30 up to a 30 percent reduction in the slowing of the disease so it, it, they're not really promising all that much and then you're getting heavy drugs into your system um which is just lining the pockets of someone somewhere and then and you're taking them for life it's a lifelong thing you know i i was on capaxone and i would have these deliveries of needles it was an injectable and um I would have to inject every day and I had no fat on my body because I was following a particular diet, which I'll go into later. Um, and it was incredibly painful, not, not the actual injection, but the stuff inside you, the product inside you stings for like an hour. I mean, I'm sure anyone watching with MS who's had this experience will, will, will say. And it, for me, it never got any less painful because I had no fat on my body. And I never saw my MS nurse either. She never actually followed up having watched me inject the first time and fainting in front of her she just waved me off and said see you in six months and I never saw her again so I was on my own I was on Capaxone for a year and then one day I just couldn't do it I had so many skin site reactions because you rotate the needle around eight places on your body but I only had four places where there was some fat my hips my belly and my thighs um um but then I started to have reactions there where the needles had been and then I couldn't, I've still got dents in my hips now. Um, it, it was just, it was just a horrible situation and I had a day off one day and then that turned into a week and then I never went back. And to this day, I've never accepted medication. So now I'm in Spain, I'm being offered a, a mild form of chemotherapy for my MS and I'm refusing it. I don't want the nausea, I don't want the hair loss. I call me vain, I just, I don't want it. I want to feel good now because I do feel good now. So, I, so I'm, I'm refusing that and I'm in a constant argument with my neurologist about that. But what I'm concerned about is my symptom management. And that's, everybody agrees that that's down to lifestyle. Um, there's, no, there's nothing you can take that will clear up your symptoms. You've got to just manage them. You know, not pushing yourself too hard, um, allowing, working with the fatigue, not fighting against it, and diet, diet and, and gentle exercise. Um, and stress reduction. So these are the things that are going to have an impact on your symptoms. So diet being such a huge issue, I immediately started looking into different diets and I came across two when I was when I was first diagnosed, Walls Protocol and the OMS, Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis. So I didn't choose the Walls Protocol. Um, I've looked into it and it's, in it's certainly interesting. It's um, It does include lots of meat, but it also includes lots of vegetables. Um, so that's interesting and the, the reason I didn't go for it was because I read different reports from different people it worked for some people and not for others and I was more persuaded by the OMS diet which is sort of like an, a Mediterranean diet um, and sort of like a vegan diet uh, except it includes fish um, and it eliminates all saturated fats um, so you're allowed polyunsaturated fats mono unsaturated anyway you, you there's certain types of fats you are allowed but saturated is not one of them and um that was a good diet in terms of the food itself was delicious it was healthy um it certainly made me look better i lost weight my skin looked great um i got many compliments when i was on the oms diet however 
didn't feel better. In fact, I'd never felt worse <laughs> because it was the first year I'd had MS and I was really experiencing the, the symptoms and, and I was, I was, I was following this diet when I was at my worst. So, so, um, it certainly didn't help in terms of my health and strength. Um, <clears throat> maybe it prevented me from being worse than I would have been by following a healthier diet of whole foods and, um, lots of vegetables and things, but, but, and healthy fats, but I, I can't say that it, it did anything that really made me stop in my tracks, um, as the carnivore diet has. I'm sure these diets, I'm sure any, any specific diet that's got research behind it and, um, in Wall's protocol, t Dr. Terry Walls herself has multiple sclerosis and she's come out of being in a wheelchair from her diet so so you know I'm not going to knock that and anybody watching who has MS I highly encourage you to explore these diets and maybe they'll have better results for you than they did for me what I have found is that the carnivore diet has had the strongest most obvious results um, and I can't help but connect the fact that myelin sheathing in the brain is made of cholesterol it's it's made of, of it's like a fatty membrane um, when I learnt that, I was fascinated, even more fascinated, because I'd already seen the benefit of the diet in my own in my own experience with it. And then learning that there's a really obvious connection there between what my disease is doing to my brain and what I am consuming that could potentially help <laughs> fix that. Um, maybe, look, I'm not a medical doctor, um, maybe I'm t way off about that, but to me that's the connection between the two, between MS and the carnivore diet that can't really be ignored. Um, I mean, a lot of people warn you off the carnivore diet because of the high cholesterol. Um, but I was watching a video by Dr. Ken Berry just last night. So he's a medical doctor and he assures people that cholesterol is not the cause of, of heart disease. And it's not the risk that it has that has been thought for, for the past few decades, or however long it's been. That's really interesting. And I want to do a video in the future specifically about cholesterol. So what's the carnivore diet? The carnivore diet is an elimination diet. Uh, you eliminate all sugar. Um, carbohydrates are sugar. So you're eliminating all fruits and vegetables and grains and all um, processed foods. And the idea behind that is that there are some plants that actually contain um, harmful, harmful components. Um, again, that's something I would like to look into a bit more. Um, is it oxidate? Oxalates. That some plants can actually, that you just think are completely harmless, can actually can, can actually irritate your body and have inflammatory effects. Sugar definitely has an inflammatory effect. You're, you're eliminating all the plants and fruits and grains. Um, you are only eating animal products. When I started this diet, um, really quite quickly, my strength and cognitive function um, radically improved um, to a degree that was obvious to the people around me, not just to me. And my life has become much more full and active since and my memory has improved and my mental clarity has improved and the only thing that's changed is my diet a apart from the myelin being made of fat and the brain basically needing fat um in order to, to to function at its optimal capacity um i mean that in itself is a good reason to consume animal products and to not and to not worry about saturated fats if that's what your brain needs um, but it's also about inflammation reduction. So I think inflammation is, is a key element in many illnesses, perhaps all illnesses. I don't know. I think there's a theory that says that inflammation is the root cause of all illness. And for me, I've certainly found that what I believe to be inflammation, uh, to be a factor, an environmental factor that I can control, which has helped me improve. So when I moved off grid, um, that was to stop. I had like so much stress and the city environment was so just felt so stressful to me um so coming up the mountain fresher air um purer environment has really helped um but what i didn't know was that my diet was causing inflammation because i had a very carbohydrate heavy diet um like too much potatoes bread pasta it was everything was based on that and fruit and veg and i didn't eat meat that often now um i can't imagine not you know and 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 i'm not tempted at all by by pasta or potatoes or anything like that so 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 you're eliminating foods that do cause inflammation and you're putting foods in your body that are nutrient dense and also non-inflammatory so to me that's quite a powerful um reason why 
why it might work for people with autoimmune conditions. Um, there's also research into gut bacteria, and I believe that they're developing um, a probiotic that you could, you could use to treat MS at the moment. So gut bacteria is a big one, um, and it's uh, the, the thinking in the carnivore diet is that, is that your gut bacteria is replaced by healthy gut bacteria. And right now there's ongoing research into, into how that might be important for autoimmune conditions, MS. Um, so there's, there's that as well. So I'm bringing up these topics and they're really just worthy of further research because there's no, from the research I've done, it's still an ongoing discussion. And I do believe that the medical establishment needs to acknowledge that and to be open to patients' anecdotal evidence because my, my story on its own doesn't really hold much weight. But when you've got mounting evidence that lots of people have got uh, similar evidence, that's when it becomes significant. It's about what research do you give credence to. Um, there's a lot of conflicting research. You've got to look into who's funding the research often. Um, and you've got to look into our assumptions being, are, are there unexamined assumptions within medical advice? So, so based on studies that are maybe out of date or have been since disproved, but somehow it's become an established fact. As the evidence mounts that these people are benefiting from it, I believe that my neurologist and all other neurologists need to be open to uh, what people are saying about about their experience on it and um, spread the word okay so there we go so I've explained what MS is I've explained what the carnivore diet is I've laid out some other diets for MS um, that may or may not have the um, desired results um, the research is still inconclusive um, and I've explained why I think that the carnivore diet might have a connection to MS but I'm just laying out a few basic ideas for now and I would love it if any of you out there who have MS, or even if you don't, chip in on this discussion and tell me what you think. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.